March 2024 marks the 36th anniversary of the publication of the seminal Batman graphic novel The Killing Joke. This is the comic book that offered a potential origin for the Joker and made a drastic change to the Bat family that lasted for about 25 years. The comic is critically acclaimed for good reason. It has phenomenal art by Brian Bolland and a deeply troubling script by comic book legend Alan Moore. It, along with The Dark Knight Returns, set the tone for most Batman comics that followed it. In 2016, Warner Brothers sought to capitalize on this popularity by releasing an animated version starring the definitive voices of Batman and the Joker, Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill. Produced by Batman the Animated Series alumni Alan Burnett and Bruce Timm. This film had all the hallmarks of being a massive success. But let's just say that it has its detractors. Before I go on to talk about the animated version and why I don't dislike it as much as everyone else seems to, yes I know that sounds like faint praise, I'm opening the floor to That One Movie Geek, a fellow YouTuber, to recount the events of the comic and talk about why he loves The Killing Joke so much. And just a warning that if you're not familiar with The Killing Joke, we're going to be discussing some heavy topics that might be distressing for some of you. I know that there are those that watch my videos with their kids, and if you do, I recommend probably skipping this one. Thank you, Luke. Pleasure to meet you all. I'm That One Movie Geek, and I talk about a lot of movies, cartoons, comics, and a lot of other things. And don't worry, I promise to not take up too much of your time. Now, with all that out of the way, let's talk about The Killing Joke. For those who are unfamiliar with the plot of The Killing Joke, I'll lay it out for you really quick. We open on a rainy night. Batman is visiting Joker in Arkham Asylum. As Batman and the Joker talk, Batman sees that he's been duped. The Joker has escaped. We're then shown an abandoned amusement park, where the Joker is prancing around, eager to buy it. No doubt creating something vile in that insane head of his. As the Joker looks at something, we're treated to the sight of a man. A fallen comedian, no less, with his pregnant wife. The man is unable to bring home a steady paycheck and thinks about just giving up. But his wife tells him to keep moving forward. And as such, he does. We then cut back to the amusement park where the Joker shakes the hand of the owner. And then puts a smile on his face. Back at the Batcave, Batman tries to figure out where the Joker is and what his next move is going to be. But something's different. Batman knows something's up. This is far different than just the standard Batman and Joker run-in. There's something much more bigger at play, but he has no idea what it is. Meanwhile, in Barbara Gordon's apartment, Barbara and Gordon are hanging out when suddenly there's a knock at the door. She answers it, only to see the sight of the Joker in a tourist outfit after he shoots her, paralyzing her from the waist down. Joker's men then knock Gordon out and drag him away. We're then treated to another installment of the flashback that we saw previously, where a day later the man is trying to earn some extra money by going on a heist. Unfortunately, he gets a call a little bit later explaining that his wife has just died. It happened when she was trying to work a baby bottle heater. There was a short, and now he finds himself unable to do the heist. They say they're sorry for his loss, but they can't do it without him, and hand him a costume that bears a very striking resemblance to the Red Hood outfit. Cutting back to present day, Barbara wakes up in a hospital. Batman is also there, and she explains to him that they took Gordon. Batman promises Barbara that he'll get him back. Waking up in the amusement park, Gordon sees Joker sitting on a throne atop a pile of baby dolls. He asks what he's doing here, and Joker simply says, you're going mad. Gordon's then strapped into a cart and sent on a ride. A ride which shows him disturbing pictures that the Joker took of the things that he did to Barbara. The things that Gordon couldn't protect her from because he was unconscious. As Gordon continues going through the ride, Batman goes around trying to find the Joker, but is unsuccessful at every turn. Eventually, Batman finds an envelope left behind by the Joker. The only thing inside? A ticket to the amusement park. As the ride ends and Gordon gets off, the Joker tells him that that was only the beginning. As we now get the conclusion of the flashback, the man put on the red suit and alongside the others began to commence the heist. However, their plan is quickly messed up as Batman shows up. However, rather than subject himself to whatever punishment Batman has in store, the man jumps off the railing that he's cornered up against, and unknowingly falls into a vat of chemicals. 
As he gets out of it, he notices something's changed about him. His skin is now as white as snow. His hair is dyed green. And all he can do is laugh. And laugh. And laugh some more. Back in reality, the Joker has put Gordon into a giant cage. Suddenly, Batman arrives in the Batmobile just as Joker stands there waiting for him. After Joker runs off, Batman frees Gordon from the cage. Gordon explains that he tried to break him, but it didn't work. All he needs is Batman to bring the Joker in by the book. Batman complies and rushes into the madhouse after Joker. Batman runs through the madhouse dodging every trap that the Joker has set for him, moving as quickly as he can to try and make sure that nothing else happens. As Batman closes in on him, the Joker explains how him and Batman aren't so different, and that all it takes is one bad day to change everything. Batman then suddenly finds the Joker and tells him how he's right. He also tells him what he wanted to tell him in Arkham. Eventually, one of them is going to die. And as such, is it worth it to keep doing this endless cycle of them constantly going after each other? The Joker then tries to shoot Batman, only to show that it was one of his fake guns. And as Joker reflects on his situation, he realizes how horrible of a person he's been. Batman then tells him that he can help him, that he can try to fix him. But Joker says it's far too late. Any hope of that died a long time ago. And... It reminds him of a joke. There are two men in the loony bin, but they don't like being there. So one night they decide to escape. They go to the roof and they're met with two even gaps that stand between them and their freedom. The first guy makes it over no problem, but the second guy's hesitant. The first guy then says he'll shine his flashlight, but the second guy just says, What do you think? I'm crazy? You're just gonna turn it off and I'll fall to my death. Now at first, the Joker just laughs. But then, Batman chuckles, and then starts laughing with the Joker. And then they both start laughing together. They laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh. And the comic ends just as it began. In the rain. And that is one of the best Batman stories ever written. AKA, The Killing Joke. Now, there's a lot to unpack with this, but let's start with the basics, shall we? The pacing and overall delivery of the story is nothing short of spectacular. Everything just lines up perfectly, and it doesn't matter how many times you've read or reread it, there's always something new or interesting to see and or analyze with it. Be it the mindset of the individuals and the situations that they undergo, or plain and simply how they react to them. And while I'm on the topic of that, the story is both amazing and disturbing. Everything from beginning to end is not only eye-catching, but just feels incredibly right, especially for a Batman story. It makes you feel exactly what you're supposed to feel at the right moment and the right time. And that's something I feel like not a lot of comics have the power to do. I feel this version of Joker, at least in terms of how menacing and insane he is, is far different than, say, if I watch Heath Ledger's Joker. Not to say Heath Ledger's version was bad or anything, because it was possibly one of the best versions of Joker that we've ever gotten. But there's something about this version of the Joker, specifically in the comic, that I feel is on the same level, but just slightly lower than Mark Hamill's version of the Joker, which we all know is the best one. There's just something about it that no one can ever replicate. It's like catching lightning in a bottle, which I think is just one of the many reasons why Joker works so well as the antagonist in this story. But going back to the story real quick, I wanted to point out the fact that this is one of the only Batman stories to have a sort of meta feel to it. Which I think definitely helps it stand out more. From how Batman and Joker treat each other and fight, to even Barbara dealing with what's happening in her current situation. And while I'm on the topic of that, let's just talk about Barbara. How she was treated in the film is possibly the worst version of her that we've ever gotten. And sure, the comic doesn't heavily involve her either, but I feel the comic has done a far better job with making her just a believable person. 
She's in an unfamiliar situation and doesn't know how to cope with it because she can't do anything about it. That's a real struggle that a lot of people go through and they're handling it here in a very mature way. Plus, it works great for Barbara in terms of her story. Seeing her learning how to get back up in the comics was one of the best arcs I think they could ever give her. Far better than the film, anyways. And before everyone starts throwing hate at me, I'm a writer, and as a writer, this is probably one of the worst things you could do with any character. It makes no sense whatsoever for Barbara to be or act like this at any given point in the film, and I completely understand what they were trying to do with their character, but you have to understand, there are unspoken rules when it comes to certain characters. And breaking one of the most vital ones is one of the worst things you can do as a storyteller, regardless of whether or not it's an adaptation. And while I do wish they did more with her in the comic, seeing what we got in the film, I'm very happy we got what we got in the comic. And in terms of the ending, I don't think there's anything that can be said about it. Or at the very least, anything that hasn't already been said before. I believe the last few panels of the comic say it all. But it leaves even more of an impact the more you think about it. And stories like that tend to exceed far better than any other story. At least in this writer's opinion. But again, that doesn't shy away from how great it is. Truthfully, I don't know what to make of the ending. But that's kind of what I love about it. There's no one defined answer, and there's so much that you can pull from to make your case as to how you think it ended. I know I certainly have, although I don't really believe anything has been set in stone for it. But regardless where you stand on it, we can't deny the fact that the killing joke has made a name for itself, both in terms of what it is, and everything that it stands for. And of course, if you have different opinions on this, then that's completely okay. You could believe this is one of the worst Batman stories ever written. Maybe you think The Dark Knight Returns is better. That's okay too. But regardless on where you stand on it, we can't deny the fact that Alan Moore and Brian Bollard, as well as everyone else that worked on the comic, made one of the best Batman stories of all time. So, Luke, what do you think? I just want to make something abundantly clear. I do not want to suggest that I think that the Killing Joke comic is in any way inferior to the animated version. It demonstrably isn't. The Killing Joke is arguably one of the most important Batman comics out there, one that pretty much every fan of the character should read. However, I think there's a lot of unnecessary negativity towards the animated version floating around out there. And if you ask any Batman fan that has seen it, you'll probably hear them foam at the mouth about that scene on the rooftop with Batman and Batgirl. And to a certain extent, I agree that it wasn't really right. I don't need to see Batman's sex life in action, okay? Especially not with the adult daughter of one of his closest allies. However, I understand why it was included. The Killing Joke comic book is only 46 pages long, and a directed DVD animated movie needs to be about 70 minutes long? It's not like they could just make every page last a minute and a half of screen time because that would completely ruin the pacing of the story. The comic's length is often problematic for DC Comics too. When they reprint The Killing Joke in hardback format, they almost always include multiple versions of the story. One with the original vibrant colour scheme, one with Brian Bolland's more muted colours, and sometimes a black and white version to bring it to the necessary page count. There was absolutely no way that Warner Brothers were going to release a 30 minute animated movie, regardless of the source material. If the alternative to this version of The Killing Joke existing is that we never got any sort of animated version, well I'll take this version any day of the week. As for the new content, I'm not going to make excuses for it because I didn't enjoy it that much, but it doesn't offend me the way it seems to offend others. Yes, it does feel like a separate story unrelated to the second half of the film, which was totally intentional by the way. They didn't really want to tinker with the beloved source material very much, although they do add a few extra scenes and extend some others. One criticism Alan Moore has made of The Killing Joke is that it is relentlessly bleak and the treatment of Barbara Gordon is something he has expressed regret over. He took one of the most popular female superheroes and did unspeakable things to her, all in the name of motivating Batman and Commissioner Gordon. Her only role in the comic is to be a vehicle of trauma for her father, Commissioner Gordon, and a means of showing the Joker's depravity. The opening section of the animated version, written by Brian Azzarello, was designed to show us that Batgirl is a capable hero in her own right. She doesn't need Batman's help to overcome the obnoxious gangster Paris and his sleazy sexual advances. Likewise, the final mid credit scene shows us that Barbara may not be able to overcome her injury, but she will adapt to it and thrive. 
and that lamented sex scene between Batgirl and Batman was designed to serve a similar role. It humanises both Batman and Batgirl, showing them to be flawed people. Batgirl becomes frustrated and lashes out when Batman won't allow her to work on the case, and she vents this frustration through a fistfight that leads to sex. This is intended to show that Batgirl is in control, that she has autonomy, that she is not a victim. Batman, meanwhile, worries about Batgirl's safety, and instead of supporting her after she narrowly avoids being sexually assaulted, he pushes her away, which is typical Batman behaviour. He also gives in to his base instincts with Barbara on that rooftop, showing that he too can make mistakes. I know that there are fans out there that like their Batman to be perfect, always one step ahead of everyone else with a game plan for any eventuality, and that's not what we get in this film. That may be something viewers don't like seeing, and I include myself in that by the way, but these scenes do serve a purpose. What Barbara gives to Batman freely, the Joker takes from her later on through a violent act. Note the scene where Batman interrogates some ladies of the night that the Joker usually frequents after he escapes Arkham. They state that this time he hasn't visited them and must have got his action elsewhere. Bruce Timm has said in interviews that he didn't interpret the scene as suggesting that the Joker had violated Barbara, but come on, what else could it mean? Regardless, the fact that the Joker stripped Barbara and took photos of her against her will is a violation in its own right. If we treat the first section of the film as supplemental material, as it was intended to be, I think that the rest of the film is a faithful adaptation of the spirit of the comic, with most of the newer scenes added to embellish what was already there. The Killing Joke is undoubtedly a problematic comic. It was intended to be. It's a story that's told mostly from the perspective of a deranged madman, and it was intended to be a hard read. The way our brains react to stimuli varies from person to person. For some people, reading something unpleasant is not as impactful as seeing it being acted out or hearing it being performed. In my experience, I was able to brush off most of the unpleasantness in the comic book. I actually found myself mesmerised by Brian Bolland's artwork. And by the way, he told me it took him two years to draw it. But with the animated version, those spoken words echo in my mind. Even now, I can still hear the Joker raising his glass to crime. And this leads me to the voice cast. Many of them are beloved figures from Batman the Animated Series. Kevin Conroy returns as Batman, Mark Hamill as the Joker, and Tara Strong as Batgirl. Hearing these definitive versions of the characters speaking and watching them do these awful things is bound to be a little jarring. In BTAS, the worst thing the Joker did was poison people with his Joker toxin, sending them into a fit of uncontrollable laughter. But here, oh boy, it's grim. Regardless of how you feel about the content of the film, I hope that you appreciate the fact that we have the definitive Batman and Joker voice actors performing this story. I can understand the studio's concerns about adapting it as an animated film. It's not something that a parent would casually pick up at Target for their kids to watch over and over again. At least I hope they wouldn't. It could just as easily have not happened, and with Kevin Conroy passing away a few years after the film came out, if they had put it off any longer, we may have got nothing. A bit like that BTAS reunion podcast that Kevin Conroy announced a few years before his death. I'm still incredibly salty that we never got to hear that, but I'm so glad they took the chance on The Killing Joke. Particular praise needs to go to Mark Hamill, who really shows his range, portraying the pitiful pre-acid bath Joker while cycling between being menacing, furious, friendly, and even manages to sprinkle in a musical number as the present day Joker. I doubt that many viewers of this video will disagree with me when I say that Hamill's work on BTAS proved he was the best Joker of all time. His work on The Killing Joke just cements his status. Kevin Conroy's Batman, as ever, is the definitive Batman. Having him perform the we need to talk speech from the beginning of the comic is a genuine treat. Batman doesn't often articulate his feelings particularly well. His fists do the talking most of the time, but this exchange between him and the Joker delightfully foreshadows the finale of the film. Speaking of the finale, the Joker's joke about the two men escaping the lunatic asylum is a commentary on Batman and the Joker's relationship. Presumably, Batman is the lunatic with the torch, but where Moore states that Batman and the Joker enjoy a laugh together just as the police arrive, some believe that Batman gives in to his madness and throttles the life out of the Joker. The film seems to share the view as the Joker's laughter falls oddly silent while Batman's laughter continues and becomes a bit more desperate. Perhaps that's another issue with the film. It takes these ambiguous talking points. Just how far did the Joker go with Barbara? Did Batman murder the Joker at the end? And provides a definitive take. Things that the original comic merely hinted at are now less subtle. People are very quick to accuse Bruce Timm of being responsible for all of the faults of the film, and as the executive producer, he does share some of the blame, or credit depending on your take. But he didn't make this film in isolation. Much like Batman the Animated Series, Superman the Animated Series, Batman Beyond, Justice League and Justice League Unlimited, The Killing Joke was a group effort, with dozens of talented, passionate people working on it, all trying to live up to one of the most influential Batman stories of all time while also making a full-length feature. I think it was an impossible task. No matter what they did, it would anger some people. 
A straight adaptation would last about 30 minutes, while making any changes would be considered blasphemous. But I commend them for trying. My advice is that if you really don't like the killing joke because of the opening story, just skip it. I tend to skip it whenever I rewatch the film, and maybe that's why I'm less enraged by it. I don't expect to change anybody's mind about the film. If you don't like it, you don't like it. Nothing I say is going to change that. But what I would like you to do is try to appreciate the intentions behind the film. Think about why they made the changes they did, and look at what it adds to the final product. Maybe, just maybe, you might feel a little different about it.